Today on Blue 58, the Packers are cruising towards the playoffs, so how do they match up against their likely opponents? We'll discuss that, but first, we need to take on an important question. When is Robert Tunyon going to get paid? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Before we get started, I want to address something I brought up last week. A couple people have reached out in support of doing something charity related. Um, that, broadly speaking, is good enough for me. Uh, I'm going to try to get a post up on thepowersweep.com this week, hopefully tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, about a couple of charities that I've researched that you may be interested in. Uh, we'll do a quick vote on that and then just try to get the word out on raising money for that. Personally, I'm leaning towards uh, one of three options right now, and we've got a, a four or five total. Uh, but top of the list for me is uh, Adrian Amos's charity that he's doing for, for Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's research and awareness, uh, the Mercedes Lewis Foundation, uh, the Vince Lombardi Cancer Foundation, um, just because they're all Packers connected and they're all very worthy causes. But I will leave that up to you guys to decide. Keep an eye out for that uh, on social media Wednesday or Thursday. We will talk about it. I'll bring it up again on every podcast coming forward. Second thing, a new episode of the Patreon podcast out today. We're talking about Aaron Jones and whether or not a big game from him and a strong couple games here is now enough reason for the Packers to resign him. So check that out on patreon.com uh, slash the power sweep. If you are a subscriber, they're great. If you're not, a dollar per month gets you access to uh, two podcasts a month that go exclusively on Patreon as well as weekly picks and links uh, for what's just going on around the NFL. So take a look at that uh, if you're interested in it. Great. Let's talk Packers. The Packers have made a whole bunch of roster moves and have a couple reported moves in the work, at least five from what I can tell. First, uh, they've signed tight end Isaac Nauta, N-A-U-T-A, played his college ball at Georgia, spent a little time with uh, with the Detroit Lions. He's going to be going on the practice squad, first and foremost, it looks like. This is big nothing for me. Uh, supposedly a pretty good athlete, or supposedly a good blocker, excuse me, but he is small for a tight end and a really poor athlete. He's not not a great tester. Um, he may be a better athlete than his testing numbers reveal. Who knows? But at least when it came time to run and jump and do all that stuff, he did not test very well. This is not adding up to me here. Uh, even when the Packers have gone with that tweener fullback tight end sort of type, most of those guys have been good to great athletes. Josiah Dogora certainly was. Uh, John Lovett was as well. Uh, this guy that went to Indiana State, not, not Tanyan, but this other guy that they've signed, as a, as a deep tight end of the practice squad, is also a plus athlete there. Um, this guy is not, and uh, I, it's just not adding up for me. We'll see if he sticks around. The other move that we've heard about this week, well, continuing on the list here, is Billy Wynn reportedly headed to injured reserve. This has not been confirmed by the Packers yet, but all the NFL Network reporters were talking about it, so it's pretty much a done deal. Torn triceps for Billy Wynn. And this is a big bummer. It sounds like he's going to rehab and try to come back yet this season and, and more power to him. But I've never even heard of a torn triceps tricep um, in my time following football. It's pretty unusual injury. So maybe that makes it easier to come back. Uh, but using your arms is obviously a pretty big deal as a defensive lineman. And he has been one of my favorite stories so far this year. So it's a bummer to see him missing any time due to injury at all, especially with the as long of a road as he had to come back. Also reportedly headed to injured reserve is Tyler Irvin. Um, Again, according to the NFL Network types, uh, he could be out as long as a month, maybe longer, and he has just had a variety of injuries over the past month or so. Wrist, ribs, now ankle it looks like, and it sounds like his season might be done here. And I would think that it probably does end up being done if Tavon Austin shows anything at all. And it is time for Tavon Austin, because given what the Packers have shown as far as putting other people in the Tyler Irvin role, they don't really have anybody else who can do it like Irvin does. Marquez Valdez-Scantling has gotten a couple shots at it, can't really do it. Uh, Aaron Jones can do it, but that's really not what you want him on the field for. Uh, you got to have somebody who has a little bit of speed in motion, uh, so probably is going to be someone like Tavon Austin. Again, this is a pretty small package. It's going to be maybe five to eight snaps a game, and then punt returns. But if he can be effective there, if he can get more speed on the field, hey, that's pretty great. 
Uh, Henry Black has been promoted from the practice squad to the active roster. I think this is going to be it for him. Uh, I think you can promote guys from the practice squad to the active roster twice. And if my memory serves correctly, this is going to be number two uh, for him. So either he's on the roster now or he has to be waived. And honestly, with Raven Green looking like he's beat up a little bit, you could do worse as far as an undrafted free agent replacement there. Uh, Good size, pretty good athlete, has... Uh, experience as that tweener safety linebacker type, especially because that's literally what he did in college. He was a linebacker who then converted to safety. Usually you see guys going the other way. But then again, the bar is pretty low here. The other option for the Packers at this point is either Vernon Scott, which is fine, um, or Will Redmond, which is considerably less fine. So I'm pretty happy with that. Finally, the Packers have signed center Anthony Fabiano to the practice squad. Big ish for a center, six foot four, three hundred and two pounds, at least tall, and a true center. Uh looking, I guess, for a little bit of center depth here. Just get somebody in the building with Corey Lindsley out for the relatively foreseeable future. Also of note that he signed as an undrafted free agent with the Baltimore Ravens in 2016. Uh that would be when Milt Hendrickson, the Packers director of football operations uh, guy, was still there. Uh, a lot of people have ended up in Green Bay after spending time in Baltimore under Hendrickson. So good always to keep those sort of connections in mind. All right. We've got a good question here about uh, about Robert Tunyon. Eric writes in and asks, I wanted to get a question on your radar since I was thinking about it recently. Bob Tunyon's contract, given his success this season, I was curious what the terms were. Seems like he's pretty inexpensive right now, but will be a restricted free agent after this season. My question is twofold. What additional rights or conditions do the Packers have, given he will be a restricted free agent and not unrestricted? Secondly, given his success, it would certainly seem the team would want to keep him around, especially if Rodgers likes him. What type of contract length and dollars do you think they should offer, and how is that impacted by the tight ends that they still have on the roster, Josiah? DeGuara and Jay Sternberger, who have been mid-level picks the last two years. So a lot to unpack here. First and foremost, what does it mean to be a restricted free agent? Basically, the shortest version is it means that your team can match any offer you get in free agency. You are technically free to sign and negotiate a contract with any team you want, but your original team has the right of first refusal. There is an additional twist here, though, that is not common to other sports. Like the NBA also has restricted free agents, or they did, not up on their current current, uh, collective bargaining agreement. But uh, it's not just right of first refusal here. Depending on what your original team does, they may get some compensation from the team that signs you if you are a restricted free agency. Teams can do a variety of tenders. You can get just the what's called the low tender, the right of first refusal tender. So this is a one-year contract worth just over $2.1 million. A team can either pay you that contract or match any contract offered to you by another team. But if they elect not to match that contract and you want to go sign with that team, they're not going to get anything in return. The second thing they can do is the original round tender. This is a one-year contract worth either $2.1 million or of the player's salary from the prior year. So uh, for Bob Tunyon, he is currently signed for $750,000 in base salary. 110% of that is uh, $825,000. So that means that this tenure and a couple of the following ones uh, would be $3.2 million, a little bit more than that. So they could, your team, if you're leaving as a restricted free agent could put an original round tender on you. So if you're a fifth round pick, you sign with another team, your team gets a fifth round pick back from the other team. Teams can also tender you with a second round tenure. Tender, it's the same thing. You just get a second round pick back. You can also do a first round tender. And there are some additional complications there, but the contracts get more and more expensive the higher up you go and you get more and more in compensation. So what are the Packers going to do here? First, They're not going to give him a contract extension before they have to. That's just not how the Packers operate, and that's generally a good way of doing business. Don't spend more money that you don't have to. Either they're going to tender Bob Tunyon at whatever deal, or he's going to sign a big contract and they'll get something back. So they're going to tender him, uh, but they're not going to sign him to a long contract before they have to. And there's 
an additional good reason to do that because the cap next year is going to be wild anyway. So if you have the option of uh, signing him to a one-year deal worth at most, if you do the first round tenor, $4.6 million, that's a pretty good deal for a starting caliber tight end, and Tunyon does seem to be that. The Packers are probably going to go with a second round tender here. The right of first refusal tender doesn't make a lot of sense because if somebody made a big deal for Tanyan, they'd want to get something back. So they're not just going to let him leave for nothing. And if honestly, if they did put the just the right of first refusal tender, tender on there, they might as well let him leave because somebody's just going to sign him for a little bit more than the Packers could afford and not have to give up anything for it. It's basically a restricted free agent deal or an unrestricted free agent deal at that point. So the Packers are probably going to end up resigning him twice. They'll tender him and then they'll re-sign him for a longer term contract down the road. We'll get to that in a second here. So what level tender are the Packers going to put on him? Well, here are some notable recent restricted free agents and tell me which one sounds the most like Robert Tunyon. Geronimo Allison, an undrafted free agent, got the low tender, the right of first refusal tender. Jamari Lattimore, a mid-round pick, also got the right of first refusal tender. And then Sam Shields, an undrafted free agent who turned out to be pretty good, ultimately ended up with the second-round tender before the Packers signed him to a longer-term deal. I think it's pretty obvious here this is probably where Tunyon is going to end up. He doesn't seem like a first-round pick sort of prospect, and given his age and where he's already played already in the league, spending a first-round pick on him, in addition to signing him to a big enough contract that he wants to leave Green Bay and the Packers wouldn't match it, doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. That just adds up to a lot of compensation for a guy who is already going to be in to his age 27 season next year. Basically, you're drafting and then signing a really expensive uh, 27-year-old tight end. The second round tenure se- tender seems to make sense. Chances are somebody's probably not going to give that up and give him a big enough contract that the Packers are going to lose him. And even if they did, getting a second round pick back is probably fairly fair compensation. But what, as Eric asks, about the other Packers tight end? First and foremost, we got to consider Josiah Dugora. He's not really a tight end anyway. That's fine. Though he's listed as a tight end, he's really more of a fullback. So I don't think he has much bearing on what the Packers do with Robert Tunyon anyway. The second thing is that he's coming off a torn ACL. So even if he was, you know, con- or comparable to what um, Tunyon offered the Packers, he's probably not going to be quite that player next year anyway. I think that clears the deck for Robert Tunyon, even if they did play exactly the same position. Then Jay Sternberger. I say this is looking pretty iffy. He's a lot closer to what Tunyon does, though he still, I think, leans a little bit more towards the the fullback, H-back end of the spectrum here. Right now, I don't think the Packers can really feel good enough about him to affect what they do with Robert Tunyon. So I don't think that's a really, really big consideration. So the final question here then is what does Tunyon stand to make long-term? This is a little bit of an interesting question because a lot can change between now and then. But assuming that he continues to produce like one of the best tight ends in the league, and he he has, he's at least the best in the NFC this year in terms of some of the advanced stats and stuff like that, some of the raw counting numbers, it hasn't, he's not necessarily the tip top of the league. But if he keeps scoring touchdowns at the rate he is, he's going to be looking to get paid like one of the top tight ends in the league. So what can we learn from their contracts? Let's look at the top four or five tight ends here in the league uh, by base salary. So the top four right now are uh, Hunter Henry, Rob Gronkowski, Travis Kelsey, and Darren Waller. What can we learn from their contracts? Well, Hunter Henry kind of goes out the door right away because he just signed a one-year $10.6 million deal with the Chargers earlier this year. So that's not really a good model for us. Same thing kind of goes... Uh, for Rob Gronkowski because he is in the last year of a six-year, $54 million deal he signed with the Patriots. Uh, Let's see, when did he sign that? Way back in 2012. And after spending a while out of the league, uh, he is now back with the uh, 
Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So not really a good comp there. Travis Kelsey starts to get a little bit more interesting because he just signed a new deal this year. He signed a four-year, $57 million contract. That's an average annual salary of $14.3 million. Now, Robert Tunyon is good. I'm not sure he's Travis Kelsey good because he's going for his fifth straight year of 1,000 yards this year. I don't think Tunyon is quite in that league just yet. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure what the Chiefs are doing here. Uh, They signed him to that deal after things started getting wild with the pandemic. Uh, They had to know that the cap crunch was coming. His cap hit goes to $15.2 million next spring. Maybe they get out of it after that. Who knows? But, well, they probably could get out of it after that because if they just bite the bullet for 2021, uh, his dead cap situation drops to zero because he has no additional money there. So a pretty team-friendly deal, I guess. That's exactly what the Chiefs are doing. What about Darren Waller? He signed a big deal with the Raiders uh, earlier this year as well, or I guess late last year. Uh, that's a four-year, $29.8 million year. Average annual salary there is $7.4 million. That's probably pretty good for Robert Tunyon. That's like second-tier tight end money. Um, he is not probably at the level of a guy like Travis Kelsey, but he's good enough to make a difference in an offense. Of course, his agent is going to put for, push for absolute top-of-market deal, uh, but I don't think he's he's probably going to get that from the Packers or anybody. Uh, finally, the, the number, the, the real big number that we should see or should talk about out there is George Kittle. He signed a five-year, $75 million contract with the 49ers uh, earlier this year. That's an average annual salary of $15 million. That's going to be the new gold standard that every tight end who thinks they can get to that number is going to try to get to. That's probably not realistic uh, for Tanya either. I'm thinking probably somewhere between uh, Waller and Kelsey. So if Waller is the floor at 7.4 per year and Kelsey is the ceiling at, what, 14.5, let's say Tunyon shoots for four years, $11 million per year. That'd be four years, $44 million. I think I'd probably do that deal. Uh, That would take him through his age 32 season, and given how NFL contracts work, you're probably looking at something like a four-year extension that's really more of like a a three-year extension. And then if he really does well, you can keep him around for that age 32 season. That's a lot of thoughts about Robert Tunyon. Let's talk some playoff matchups here. So we've got a month of football to go here before we talk about playoffs in uh, in real concrete terms. Got a lot of things that can happen, a lot of matchups that can move around. Uh, Packers are going to be in the playoffs more than likely as an NFC champion, NFC North champion. So that means they'll be hosting a playoff game at some point. Where, when, and who is up in the air. But as it stands right now, it looks like there's eight teams that are most likely going to be making up the rest of the field with them in the NFC. Things could shake out a little bit differently. Obviously not the NFC East isn't going to be sending two teams NFC West probably isn't going to be sending three teams, but we'll see. But right now, it looks like the eight other teams that are most likely getting into the playoffs with the Packers are the Vikings, the Seahawks, the Cardinals, the Rams, the Buccaneers, the Saints, the Washington football team, and the New York Giants, in some order there. Right now, the Saints are the top seed. We'll go from there. I don't think seeding is necessarily the best way to look at this. I think the best way to look at these potential playoff matchups is is how scared I would be for the Packers to play against them. So let's divide them into tiers. Four tiers I've got here. The first and foremost is not scary at all. And this is going to be your New York Giants and your Washington football team. The Giants have a pretty solid defense. They are currently 10th in yards, 9th in points, and 17th by DVOA. Special teams is ninth by DVOA. To me, this is a, a pretty pretty balanced but not very good team. Their offense is putrid, uh, though they do run the ball pretty well. Overall, this is not going to be the sort of team that scares you really at all in the playoffs if you're if you're pack if you're the Packers. Same goes for Washington. Their defense is is real good. They have a legitimate defense, especially against the pass. 
that could be a problem for the Packers if Washington's offense overall was any good. And they are playing a little bit better with Alex Smith at quarterback, but I don't think it's enough to really scare me as somebody who supports the Packers here. So the NFC East, haha, more like NFC least. Everybody make that joke now. Um, isn't really doing much for me. I'm I'm not particularly worried about those teams. The next tier has two teams here. And I describe this tier as a scary or teams that are as scary as a jump scare in a movie that you know is coming. You know those scenes in movies that tend to be a little bit scary. You know that they're setting you up for something that's going to pop out at you just from somewhere. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. And ultimately, it's more of a relief when it comes than than being actually scary. It's not something that's going to keep you up at night thinking about that jump scare. The two teams that fall into that category for me are the Minnesota Vikings and the Los Angeles Rams. Let's talk about the Rams first. The Rams, to me, are in this category because, although their offense is very good, I think it's becoming a little bit predictable. And I've seen a lot of writing about this this year. Everybody seems to know what the Rams are about on offense. That's not to say Sean McVay isn't a very good coach. Uh, He is a very good coach, and he can still do that neat party trick that everybody fawns over where he can tell you about plays from um, games that he was in. Good job, Sean. Uh, But the real story here is their defense. Uh, They have the number one rushing defense in the league by DVOA, the 11th pass defense, or the the fifth pass defense. Um, They're good. They're good overall. And this is the sort of team that it seems like could put a – put a scare in the Packers, but I think ultimately the Packers would overcome them unless they really let the offense get cooking. I don't think they have the sort of offense that, or the defense that is really going to shut down the Packers, especially this version of the Packers offense. But I think if they got rolling on offense, they could put a, a pretty significant scare into the Packers. But none of them are as scary as this next tier. These are teams that are as scary as a movie scary enough that I don't want to watch it. And to be fair, that is virtually every scary movie. I'm not a big horror movie fan, but these are the teams that would be in that category. Just teams that I would say, no, I'm not interested in that really at all. These are not teams that the Packers couldn't beat. These are teams that I would be significantly concerned about. First, the Arizona Cardinals. Arizona scares me here. They've got a high-powered, very modern, like hyper-modern offense. Spread offense with Kyler Murray. Two very good receivers. A very efficient run game. A middling defense, to be sure. But there's a lot that is scary on that offense. This seems like a team that could beat the Packers in a shootout, either in Lambeau or in Arizona or just falls on its face and loses to the Packers in a blowout. But the Cardinals are scary to me, and it's always going to be weird and maybe give you a little bit of contact horror that the Packers have lost to the Cardinals in the playoffs twice in the Aaron Rodgers era, 2009 and 2015. Very different games, both of them. But still weird that the Packers lost to the Cardinals twice in the playoffs. The Seattle Seahawks are next up in this in this tier, and I think that's for reasons that should be obvious. Russell Wilson, for as badly as the Seahawks played against the Packers overall in that playoff game last year, still had them in it. The Seahawks were driving for the lead late in that game. And I shouldn't have to tell every anybody who roots for the Packers why we should be a little bit wary of the Seahawks in the playoffs. That was why, what was that, 2016 when the Packers had the the Giants at home in the playoffs? That I think we probably got a little bit more worked up about that game than was probably warranted just because of the Packers' history there. Packers have some history with the Seattle Seahawks in the playoffs. And even a win over the Seahawks last year doesn't really absolve all of that. Furthermore, I think out of any quarterback the Packers are likely to play in the playoffs. Russell Wilson scares me the most. Sure, Kyler Murray is young and exciting. Sure, Kirk Cousins and Jared Goff can be very competent to very, very efficient at times. 
Sure, Tom Brady is still at times Tom Brady, and they've got a good offense around him or good skill position players at least around him. And sure, Drew Brees is going into the Hall of Fame, but Russell Wilson is the scariest in that group. And he is scary enough, combined with Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, that I'd be very scared for the Packers to play them in the playoffs. The final one in this tier is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I think that should be pretty obvious. If anybody should know the book in the NFC playoffs for beating the Packers, it's the Buccaneers. The Vikings have also beaten the Packers, sure. But I think that's a game where the Packers beat themselves more than the Vikings beat them. Tampa Bay Buccaneers can't say the same thing. They straight up beat the Packers. And they can do it again. And I would be scared to see them in the playoffs. That one really doesn't need more explanation. The final tier is what I would call existential threat. Scary. And that's the New Orleans Saints. There are a lot of good reasons, I think, to be skeptical about the New Orleans Saints. But in the NFC playoffs right now, I think if there is a juggernaut, it seems like the Saints. They have a strong, efficient offense that can beat you through the air and on the ground. They have a defense that can shut you down through the air and on the ground. Their special teams don't screw it up for them. They can score a lot of points. They can beat you in a defensive game. I think the Saints are scariest to me because the Packers could still do everything that they do very well and lose to the Saints. The Packers played a really good game against the Saints early this season. And as well as they played, the Saints were still in it. In fact, the Packers could have played really well and lost that game. I think it's possible that that could happen again with a negative outcome. And this, to me, seems like the most important reason for the Packers to get to do whatever they can to get home field advantage. If they have to play the Saints, it'll most likely be in the NFC Championship game. And I want more than anything, if I'm playing the Saints, for that game to be at Lambeau Field in the cold and wind. Because even if the Packers have not played well in the elements this year, I feel a lot better about the Packers figuring it out than I do about 43-year-old Drew Brees, who can't throw the ball downfield at all, doing the same. But in any other circumstance, really in any circumstance, I think the Packers could still play well against the Saints and lose. I'm not sure that's true of any other potential playoff matchup. I think if the Packers go out and play well against the Buccaneers, they'll beat the Buccaneers. Same goes for the Seahawks, Rams, Cardinals, or Vikings. They shouldn't even have to play all that particularly well against the the Giants or Washington. The Saints seem to be a different story, and that's why they are the scariest to me right now. Agree? Disagree? What are your thoughts? Let me know. I'd love to hear them. Uh, Check us out uh, wherever you download this show, on YouTube, uh, on Google Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, wherever. Uh, Reach out. Let us know. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, Also, check us out on Patreon. We've got, again, another episode of the Patreon podcast going up this week. Check that out. I would love to check in with you there as well and uh, have a little bit of a conversation about Aaron Jones and bringing him back into the fold. We're also doing a little bit of of a new segment there, so check that out as well. In the meantime, if you like this show, if it was beneficial to you, if there's someone else that you think would benefit from hearing it, do me a favor, go ahead and share it with that person. It's going to help us continue to further our mission of uh, growing this conversation we're having around the Packers and ultimately helping everybody become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.